there was a famous line that I quoted in the book and that many people have heard of where he said, we are living in a computer programmed reality. And the only clue we have is when some variable is changed. You're the author of Simulation Hypothesis and Startup Myths, and you're an indie film producer, and you're a brilliant MIT person. Tell me about your background. Uh, sure. So, you know, I started off um, studying computer science back at MIT w w way back in the day and uh, ended up in the software industry, uh, did a couple of startups in enterprise software. So, you know, really got to learn about how big companies view technology. And then, you know, after selling my last enterprise software company to a division of EMC Documentum, I moved out to Silicon Valley. And before that, I was in Boston and decided to get involved with video games. Um, and so this was in 2007 when uh, Facebook had just introduced their gaming platform and Apple had yet to introduce its app store. <laughs> And so I, I got involved with a couple of, of Facebook gaming companies. Uh, and then when Apple introduced its app store, I, I co-created a game called Tap Fish, which was one of the, the top grossing games back in the day. I think it was 2010 now, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, and that was when in-app purchases were relatively new and people weren't really used to spending money on virtual items. Today, of course, it's you know multi-billion, tens of billions, hundreds of billion dollar uh, industry. Uh, so I was in kind of at the beginning of that that whole wave, um, and uh, you know after that I ended up uh, becoming an investor, and uh, in both independent films as well as you know more startups. I, I went back to MIT and did a little program called Play Labs, which was for playful technology startups, uh, which could be video games, virtual reality, augmented reality. That was fun. I did that for a few years, uh, and then the last few years I've been focused a little more on my writing. Uh, I wrote Startup Myths partly because of the, the MIT program. I wanted uh, a way to encapsulate some of the lessons I'd learned in my 25 years of working with startups. Uh, and then I wrote the simulation hypothesis just because it encapsulated a lot of what I had been thinking about in terms of video games, but also reality and consciousness and religion and how it relates to how our technology as a society is going to develop over the next, you know, not years, but decades, really, and if not centuries. Yeah. So your days right now, you're waking up, you're writing these books, you're enjoying life. Yeah, for the most part, you know, I'm still doing uh, uh, calls with entrepreneurs who are looking to raise money. So I still work with a few VC firms, um, still do some angel investing myself. Uh, uh, but yeah, for the most part, I try to do as much writing as I can, although, you know, it became difficult when the coffee shops here shut down <laughs> because that was my office, basically. <laughs> what you have to do is build a mock coffee shop in your house. Yeah, well, I, I started to get, get, get used to, to working in the house again, which annoyed my, my girlfriend. <laughs> Just because her office is here and I usually work you know, out either at an office or in coffee shops. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna boot you out of the simulation. <laughs> Go to the coffee shop <laughs> right. and get some work done. <laughs> exactly, build you a virtual office. <laughs> When did you, we'll talk about the, the work. Which one do you want to talk about first? Do you care or can we just talk about either of them? Uh, either of them is fine, yeah. Okay, I'm really interested in the simulation hypothesis. When I, they said, uh, you know, he's got this new book coming out about the, the work in the Silicon Valley and startups. And I was like, how can you expect, like <laughs> when you do media <laughs> interviews, everybody must want to talk about the simulation hypothesis. <laughs> That's true, actually. When I came out with Startup Myths last year, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, most of the interviews ended up veering at some point <laughs> towards <laughs> the idea of the simulation, just because it's, it's an idea whose time has come. And I think, you know, people are writing about it in mainstream media. People are writing op-eds in the New York Times about simulation and whether we should find out if we're living in one. And so, uh, yeah, it tends to be a very popular topic. Plus, video games has become one of the biggest industries on Earth, bigger than uh, really Hollywood is a box office, you know, in any given year. Uh, and so that's kind of where the overlap is between the two books is that a lot of my experience in the past decade in startups has been in video games. Uh, and that kind of laid the foundation for, uh, you know, the way that I was thinking about the simulation hypothesis, which is not necessarily exactly how other people think about it. Yeah. Yeah. You could maybe combine them like how to do a startup inside the simulation. 
<laughs> That's right. You can you can earn virtual currency uh, <laughs> with a virtual job. It's funny. A few years ago, we had uh, there was this um, uh, game called Second Life, which I don't know if you've heard of. Oh yeah. But you know, people used to go in and they used to actually have jobs and they'd earn these uh, called Linden dollars, which are virtual bucks. And again, that was relatively new back then. This idea that you could actually earn virtual currency, you could own virtual land. There were people that were the first virtual real estate millionaires. Uh, that That isn't nearly as popular now as it was for a couple of years then, but now there's Roblox and uh, Fortnite and, and there's a lot of different environments, virtual environments, which you know we generally, at least here in Silicon Valley, refer to as uh, the, the budding metaverse, right? <laughs> And so, the, you know, that was a term coined by Neil Stevenson back in his book, Snow Crash, way back. I don't know when that was, like late 80s, maybe, or early 90s. Uh, but it was this idea of a decentralized virtual world where you could log in from anywhere. Uh, and kind of an updated version of it was shown in Ready Player One, where you put on virtual reality headsets and people, you know, used it for school. That's how they went to school. That's how they went to work. That's how they socialized. Uh, and I think it's taken on, you know, a whole new level of meaning since the pandemic, since people have been socializing on Zoom and getting Zoom fatigue. And so, <laughs> you know, gaming has, has become a, a fun place for people to hang out. Yeah. That's one of my favorite movies, Ready Player One. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Have you read uh, Ready Player Two? Uh, which is the new book. I'm learning about it right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Ernest Klein. So when he wrote Ready Player One, uh, he came out with it in, I think, 2010. And back then, there were no virtual reality headsets. So, you know, he, he said it in like 2046, I think, or something, thinking, yeah, maybe we'll have them by then. Well, just a couple of years later, the VR headsets started to come out. Uh, Oculus and HTC and all these other different um, companies have introduced their headsets. So the technology kind of caught up to what he was saying, even though VR isn't nearly as popular as it was in, in Ready Player One, where everyone used it. Uh, and so in his second book, he decided to, to make sure the technology jump you know, jumped forward so that it won't catch up within a couple of years. And so in the first few pages, uh, the, the main character, uh, Wade, what was his name? Wade Watts, I think, <laughs> realizes that um, the guy who created the Oasis, the virtual environment, had also created a brain computer interface, you know, which we call BCIs. And so you just put the little things on your head and it's as if you can be in the environment, you can feel everything that's in there. And then they have, you know, this is quite interesting. They have something called the Oni, which is the Oasis uh, neural interface, which is you know this thing that it connects in. But you can do what, what are called Oni recordings. So people can record any experience, whether it's skiing on, in the Himalayas or you know strange sexual encounters, <laughs> you can record them and anybody else can replay them and they'll feel them as if they were actually there. And, and so, you know, the book starts with that in the first few pages, and there's a big moral dilemma around should we release this or not, because, you know, if you can experience going to India, let's say, or Mexico without <laughs> having some of the, the travel related issues, then why actually go there anymore, right? So this, this is, you know, I'm spending time on this because it's, it's interesting, the way that I started to write the simulation hypothesis was in, I think, 2016, when VR was just becoming a little more mainstream, I was playing a virtual reality ping pong game. And, you know, when I started to play the game, it felt so real that at the end of the game, I decided to put the paddle down on the table and lean against the table. Of course, there was no table. <laughs> it was all in virtual reality. And so I realized, oh, you know, the responsiveness that we've already gotten with the, the physics engine, it wasn't even the graphics, right? I mean, a lot is said about making the graphics really good and lifelike, but they weren't even that lifelike. It just felt so real that my brain forgot for a second that I was in a virtual reality environment. And so I started to think, well, what would it take for us to build something like the Matrix? You know, where if you remember in the Matrix, Keanu Reeves, character Neo, and everybody else had these uh, wires plugged in so that we wouldn't be able to distinguish between re physical reality and virtual reality. And that was really the genesis of the book. And I came up with these 10 stages of technology, excuse me, that we would need to get to. Uh, and, and, and so that was the starting point for the book, even though it went in many different directions. I am excited. I'm very excited. Right when you said Ready Player Two, I was hoping that they put a neural link inside of them. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. And they did, right? Yeah. And so, you know, more and more, we're starting to see these ideas uh, in science fiction uh, become commonplace. You know, uh, in, in 1999, there were actually three simulation related movies. And so, you know, The Matrix, 
there was the 13th floor and then there was existence uh, as well. And which is, you know, I think the other two are not as well known as the matrix, but turns out this year there's actually four simulation related films being released. So this is sort of the biggest year of simulation movies since 99. There was a, a documentary called a glitch in the matrix, which just came out um, about people that believed were living in a simulation. Uh, there was a movie called Bliss with Selma Hayek and uh, Owen Wilson that Amazon just put out. Then there's a Ryan Reynolds movie called Free Guy, I think, uh, where he's a, an NPC, a non-player character inside this video game. Um, and then there's obviously The Matrix 4, which is coming out later this year. So it's, it's become kind of a resurgent theme in science fiction, but also in academia and other places also. One of the things that I think a lot about is how as humans, like if we imagine that we're this single giant organism that's distributed, right? So we look at humanity and we have this property of we imagine and then we do. And we imagine through our films and then certain things come about, which it's almost like that's the that's a purpose. It's a part. It's like our imagination is the film industry making this content. And then we look at it and we, we filter it and we discuss these ideas and they're playing potential scenarios out through these storylines. And we sort of pick and choose what we want to build. And then they, they start to grow faster and the thoughts sort of take off. Like, as you said, it's progressing. We're getting more of these simulation movies at the same time, our technology is advancing forward. And then I see that you're into filmmaking and you've got these great ideas. And I guess my big question here is when you saw this simulation hypothesis emerging from the ethos as this idea or this concept, what caused you to actually want to dedicate time to write a book on it? Well, you know, touching on that first thing you said where we, you know, come up with ideas and we can use those as scenarios and filter them. Uh, there was actually a paper written, I think, a couple of years ago about the threat simulation hypothesis. And they said like people who watch horror movies, for example, you know, have an easier time adjusting to situations like the pandemic uh, or people that dreams may be ways that we rehearse, you know, for, for bad situations, nightmares in particular, and that we're better able to cope with bad situations. Uh, you know, and, and, and that was a really interesting, you know, little finding about, you know, how we think about things. And actually, you know, my own investigations. So first I started off on this technology thread and said, okay, you know, what do we need to build in our virtual reality and our augmented reality to get to the, what I call the simulation point? We can talk about that in a minute. Uh, but I also have spent a lot of time investigating other areas of human consciousness, whether it's through meditation, uh, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences. So there's this kind of whole area of, of different states of consciousness, shamanic journeying, um, with, whether you do it with, dr with uh, drugs, which I haven't really tried, but, or you do it with uh, drumming uh, and rhythmic breathing, which gets you into a different state of mind. And so, you know, what I found was when I laid out all the 10 stages that would make it so that we would get to the point where we couldn't distinguish if we were living in a simulation or not, turns out a lot of that technology already exists. It's in biological form and it happens to us every night when we dream, right? So when we dream, we feel like we're inside the dream. We've created this kind of simulated world. It looks real to us, right? We can't really tell. Uh, but turns out there are people that are able through a practice called lucid dreaming to remember that there's a part of them that's actually lying in the bed and that what they're experiencing now is not real, right? So you kind of forget and there's this, there's, this kind of level of consciousness that you cross over between waking and dreaming where you forget the other side. Just like in the morning, you might remember the dream clearly when you wake up, but you know, by 2 p.m. in the afternoon, unless it was a really important or vivid dream, you probably have forgotten about it. It was just a jumbled mess of stuff that you remember. And so you know, we don't remember what's on the other side of this wall of consciousness. And so as I thought about that, I realized that you know, the, the Tibetan yogis in particular had this whole practice called Tibetan dream yoga. It was one of the six yogas of Naropa. And it was kind of a lucid dreaming type of thing where they trained you to recognize that you're moving into this state and that what you're seeing in the dream world is actually an illusion. And now there's a spiritual reason for that. They wanted you to recognize that just like when you're dreaming, there's another part of you that's asleep. In the same way, when we're awake, there's another part of you that's asleep somewhere while you think this is the real world and you think this is not an illusion. 
Uh, and so, you know, the fact that I had spent so much time in, in, in Silicon Valley and building games and investing in game companies and in exploring consciousness, you know, was really part of the motivation that made me want to, to dedicate time to writing this book, because I felt that uh, it, it was a way to bridge the gap, you know, between uh, people who thought one way and people who thought another way, right? I spent a lot of time with academics and scientists and engineers who were very left-brained and the material world is all there is. And I spent a lot of time with people that were exploring these states of consciousness. Uh, and, you know, these areas rarely intersect. Uh, and so, you know, I, I thought the simulation hypothesis was a way that I could talk to both and they could talk to each other. <laughs> and it turns out it's a pretty powerful metaphor for that reason. Uh, because pretty much all the religions have been telling us that the world around us isn't real. And so this provides a more technological and at least partially scientific framework for thinking about what that could mean. Have you ever had a lucid dream? Yeah, I used to uh, practice it uh, reasonably often. And so there's a, what you call a lucidity test that you can do. So there's a couple of ways to recognize you're in a dream. One is when you see something absurd uh, and you realize that it's absurd, or you see someone that's died and you realize, hey, that person supposed to be dead. So you, you notice something that's odd and off about the dream. That can lead to lucidity. Uh, and then there's this idea of a lucidity test where there's something you can do inside a dream that you can't do in physical life. And in my case, it I, have, I don't do it that much anymore, uh, but I used to do it a lot where you tr I try to fly because in a dream I can fly and in physical reality, I can't theoretically, right? And so, yeah, uh, yeah that's right. <laughs> and so there have been many times when I, when I said, I'm not going to do my lucidity test because this is obviously real life. It's not a dream, duh. And then I did it and I would float up <laughs> into the air and realize, oh, holy crap, this is actually a dream. This is not physical reality. Uh, when I was absolutely convinced before that, that it was physical reality. And so, you know, it becomes an interesting metaphor for, what we're talking about with simulation is, you know, people are convinced that this is the real world. And, you know, there's a, there was this uh, philosopher, Bishop Berkeley, who, after whom the town and, and, and university in Berkeley is named, you know, who, who talked about idealism, which was the idea that you know, the world doesn't really exist. And there was a scientist, Dr. Johnson, I think, when, when, when Berkeley said, you know, how do you refute this? He goes, I refute it thus. And he kicked a rock and he said, there, that's real, right? <laughs> Problem is, that's not really a refutation because in a dream, you would think that everything is real when you're in there because everything seems that way. You know? I have had one lucid dream. I got into it. I was reading about it several years ago, probably five, six years ago. And I was like, people are having these things. This is unbelievable to me. And so I started reading about them. And the trick that worked for me, it took me three weeks and I had, I did it once successfully. But the trick that worked for me was looking at clocks and looking away. And then there was something oh. about the clock. Oh yeah, yeah. If you look at it and look back, it's vastly different time in your dream. So in my dream, I'd look at it, it'd be like 11 you know, AM. And then I'd look at it again, it'd be 3.57 PM. So for some right. reason, so yeah, that, clock, that's another technique that works or looking at writing or a book and okay. you look away and you look back and, and it looks different. Uh, there was a gentleman named Carlos Castaneda who wrote a bunch of books back in the seventies and, you know, his, his, his mentor gave him the task of finding his hands in the dream with, with all these techniques, the problem is remembering to do them. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so one way to get to remember to do them is if you remind yourself to do it during the day. So like here, I'm talking to you, am I really in a dream or not? I might look at a clock and look back and look at it again. Uh, and if you do it enough times during the day, then perhaps you will remember at some point during your dream, which is probably what happened with you. It took you three weeks, right? But That's eventually exactly what I did. I did it during the, the I left that part out. The instructions were to do it several times throughout the day. And then you kind of, you, I just did it in the dream. Right. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. So that that's another technique. And so you know, the Tibetans took this to a whole another level because it wasn't just about recognizing, you know, the dream. And the other thing that's hard with lucid dreaming is you might recognize you're in a dream, but pretty soon what usually happens is either you wake up because you become too lucid or you just go back to a non-lucid dream. And that and so, you know, they've developed techniques for trying to keep that state of, of lucidity to what they call a state of clarity. And theoretically, then you can see what goes on beyond all that. I, the way that I say it is beyond the simulation, of course. They say, you know, beyond Maya or illusion, which is the term that's used in the, in the Buddhist and, and the Hindu traditions.
And that's exactly what happened to me. I was in a cafe. I stood up. I realized I saw a clock in the cafe. I realized that I was in a dream. I said, this is great. I think I said something like, everybody take your clothes off. And like, everybody just got <laughs> naked. And then, but like before, like I act before they actually got naked, I just saw everyone start to take their clothes off. And then I got this thought. I ran outside. I was in the street and I'm like, I can, I bet you I can fly. And I got, and I just flew. And then I got so excited. I woke up. I was like, I'm flying, I'm flying. And then I woke up and I was like, oh man, three weeks of trying and I get it. And it's gone in like 10 seconds. <laughs> Yeah. That's great. I don't think I've heard anyone use that particular command for everyone to take off their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the only way I could prove to myself that like I was legitimately there. It made sense at the time. Things don't always make sense in the dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I've used it to create things to say, okay, if I can create a flower or something, <laughs> then this must be a dream, right? So there's all kinds of techniques. The trick is, like you said, you know, it, it lasted 10 seconds and then... <laughs> You either wake up or you forget about it. And, and that's, you know, part of the forgetfulness that we have in the dream state, which many of the ancient traditions say is what happens here. Like the Greeks talked about crossing the river of forgetfulness, right? As we incarnate into this life. Uh, and in the Chinese traditions, there's Meng Po, who's the goddess of forgetfulness. And she brews the tea of forgetfulness. And we drink that, you know, when we're born and after we die so that we forget what happened before. Or in the case of, you know, when you die, you forget some of the, the tough things that might have happened to you in your life uh, before you move on to the next stage. And so all of those are metaphors, right? I mean, Shakespeare used the metaphor of life being like a stage play. The Hindus talked about the Leela, which means the play, the grand play of the gods. I would like to think that, you know, if they were alive today and the Buddhists talk about the dream, uh, that they would use a different metaphor. And turns out that the video game metaphor is actually, you know, pretty appropriate because, you know, we all are playing the game. And so one of the things that I really like to talk about with simulation is, is the distinction between the NPC version and the RPG version. And so NPC means non-playable character in video games. RPG stands for role-playing game. So NPCs are the AIs that we encounter within the game. Uh, I guess if you're using the matrix analogy, those would be the Agent Smiths, right? The code, the AI. And the RPGs would be Neo, Morpheus, and everybody who exists outside the game, just in the same way that I might have an avatar in World of Warcraft or in Fortnite, we become the avatar there's a part of us outside that's playing the game today. And so when a lot of people in, in the scientific and academic world talk about simulation, they're talking about the NPC version. We're all just a bunch of AIs running on a computer uh, and, and that's it. But you know, I like to say, well, there's also this RPG version where we exist outside the simulation. We have chosen certain storylines and certain challenges and certain quests. Uh, and it's a multiplayer game. So different people can make decisions. Right, and so I'd like to think today that if 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 the ancients were around, uh, like the ancient rishis, they would say, life is like an interactive video game, right? <laughs> because we all have choices that we make, and we're all sort of playing it together. But there might be certain timelines and and things that are scripted, but everything else you can make decisions on, and that will determine how the game plays out for you. Yeah, it's like a an airplane or a Tesla. It, it has autopilot mode, but you can take control. I feel like it's a it's a blurred line it's a mix i feel like sometimes it's in pc autopilot sometimes you're making decisions i don't feel like it's yeah. fixed in one way or the other i feel i know some people like whether they even understand simulation hypothesis or not i can tell when like people are afk like right? like they are not at their keyboard <laughs> they are just going through life you know that's right yeah like as if they have a little afk or <laughs> yeah <laughs> above their heads right mm hmm well, and those two, by the way, aren't mutually exclusive. Like when I play a game like World of Warcraft, there are the NPCs and there are other players uh, and, and cl other PCs or player characters. And so you can have both within the same environment. And I think that's, you know, that's probably a better metaphor uh, for how we think about this simulation idea. It is. And then I, I believe we have choice to toggle between them. Right. That makes a lot of sense. You know, just like when, when you choose a character in a game, you know, you might choose what guild or clan you're with and you might choose what achievements or quests you have, but then you still have to go through those quests. And so, you know, it's up to you whether you accept a particular quest or you decide not to do it. Uh, and so I believe we have storylines uh, that perhaps put us on autopilot, like you were saying. I like that analogy. Um, and we also can take control and change that. And sometimes we're veer off track, 
And, and so it becomes a way to think about, you know, some of the challenges uh, that might happen to us in life, whether it's, you know, bad health or death of friends or loved ones, et cetera, that, you know, some people say to me, well, if I was going to create a simulation, I wouldn't make it like this. I would make it where, you know, I'm a trillionaire and, uh, you know, I, I have all the things that I want, et cetera. And well, if you remember in the matrix, in the matrix sequels, they revealed that the first version of the matrix was kind of this idyllic, peaceful place and the human mind didn't accept it. Right. And in the same way that there's no point in making a movie about people that are just happy all the time and just sitting around enjoying life. You know, that's not the same as a, uh, you know, an Indiana Jones film where he has to go out and find the clues and has challenges and has opponents. It wouldn't be that interesting for us to play this game if there were no challenges. The challenges here are different than in Grand Theft Auto <laughs> or in World of Warcraft, right? Um, but they're still there. And so, you know, that gives us a framework to think about things. Uh, and so, you know, that's why I find when people say, well, what relevance does this have for me and my life? You know, uh, you can view it as a metaphor for how you go through life. And I think it, it helps put things into perspective that you may have chosen some of these challenges for yourself, uh, just in the same way that, you know, I became an entrepreneur. I mean, I knew if you had talked to me in high school, I'd say, oh, yeah, I'm going to become a software entrepreneur and then I'm going to become a writer. Right. How did I know that back then? I mean, I hadn't even been to college or had a computer science degree at that point, And I hadn't written anything longer than like a couple page story <laughs> at that point. Right. Uh, but yet it was just this sense of, of knowing uh, because I believe that was part of the storyline uh, that I had already selected, you know, within this this what I call the great simulation our simulation game. Now, when you hear people talk about it in public, I've, I heard one guy on the Joe Rogan podcast and like Joe Rogan could not get over this concept of probability that we are most likely in the simulation. And I was like, I, for all the places for him to get hung up, I was like, I love this guy, but like, what are you doing? Like, let him go. <laughs> like, let him continue on <laughs> yeah. past, like get over the fact that it's just statistically probable and like, let's move on. And the whole interview, like the whole two hours was this guy explaining statistic probability to Rogan. <laughs> and I yeah. Was like, so it was yeah. uh, Nick Bostrom. So, yep. you know, back when the matrix came out in 99, this idea was considered science fiction. And, you know, he's, uh, he's an Oxford professor now. He's a, he used to be a philosopher and he wrote this paper in 2003, you know, are you living in a computer simulation? And I'd say more than most other things that was, uh, you know, his, his efforts were what brought this up into a serious discussion as opposed to just a science fiction discussion. And it wasn't that hard of a probability. You know, he basically said that if somebody creates a simulation anywhere at any point in time, they're going to create lots of them. There's only one base reality, there's lots of simulated realities. So what are the odds that you're in base reality versus simulated reality? You just use simple, simple probability to say there's more of these than these. It's one out of X. If X is large, then you're more likely in that than that. You know, <laughs> that was basically the, the probability argument. But I think Joe Rogan got caught up because he was saying, well, we're not there yet. Right. So yeah. how can we be talking about probabilities in the future? And that it's interesting because the first third of my book is about how we get there as a civilization uh, with great uh, BCIs, with AI, with augmented reality, photorealistic AR, VR. And then the argument is, OK, if we can get there in, let's say, uh, you know, people always ask me, how long will it take us? I say probably 100 years or so. We'll get to the simulation point, uh, what I call stage 10. Um, and if we can get there in 100 years, that's not that big of a deal in galactic timeframes, right? If you think of a civilization that's a, a thousand years ahead of us or maybe a million years ahead of us, right? So what are the chances that they get there? Well, they're pretty high. So, um, you know, Bostrom also said it's possible no one ever gets there. But I think the fact that we've gotten so far, I mean, Elon Musk, you know, made a famous statement about this where he said 40 years ago we had Pong, which was two squares and a dot. And today we have MMORPGs, we have AR and VR. If you assume any rate of improvement at all, right? Forget my 50 to 100 years. Let's say it takes us 500 years, right? I mean, computers haven't even been around for 500 years, right? So where will they be 500 years from now? Probably be quantum computing simulations that are going on. Uh, so it's pretty likely that we can get there. And if we can get there, you know, who's to say that people haven't already gotten there? In fact, it's pretty likely, I'd say, that somebody's already gotten there and they've created lots of simulations and it could be that we are in one now. That's the basic argument. I love it. I think you should write a book, do a story. It's kind of Ender's Game where it's like a young young kid, right? And this this hero of the story ends up becoming responsible for 
like think very far out into the future where we have these millions of simulations. And then at some point, the end of that storyline is that someone hits reset, right? And like resets <laughs> everything. And then he's right. responsible for like having to live through these things. And then he gets to decide if he hits that reset button. <laughs> That's great. Fun one. Yeah, I have thought about doing a science fiction novel uh, on this topic. But, uh, you know, right now I've been, uh, my next book is actually called The Simulated Multiverse. Uh, and it's coming out later this year. And it's kind of a, a follow up to the simulation hypothesis. So, you know, most of the simulation hypothesis is discussing this idea that we live in a simulation. But, you know, one of the interviews that I did when I, um, uh, when I wrote the book was with uh, the wife of Philip K. Dick. You know, he, he passed away in uh, 82, just before Blade Runner came out. And of course he got really famous after that. Uh, and so he gave a speech in 1977 in Metz, France at a sci-fi convention where he, there was a famous line that I quoted in the book and that many people have heard of where he said, we are living in a computer programmed reality. And the only clue we have is when some variable is changed. And so, you know, when I was talking to his wife, Turns out, you know, this wasn't just a random thing he said. He had this whole philosophy uh, in that speech. And if you go back and listen to the speech, and I found the full text and I saw the video and realized that what he was talking about was actually multiple timelines in a simulation. So he said the variables have changed. We would have a feeling of deja vu, like we are reliving the same moment, but with something different. Uh, and it turns out that he believed that that had happened to him in a small way like when he was went in the bathroom and looked for the light that he thought was a chain light. This is back in like the 70s. Uh, but in fact, it was a light switch. And he, and he knew for sure he remembered it being a chain. And he said, okay, something has, somebody has changed something. Right? And so he wrote this uh, story called The Adjustment Team uh, based on this, which became the movie The Adjustment Bureau with uh, Matt Damon and Emily Blunt a few years back. Um, and so that was a small thing. But then in a big way, uh, there's this recent uh, adaptation of his works on Amazon called uh, The Man in the High Castle. And, and The Man in the High Castle is about a alternate timeline where uh, Germany and Japan won World War II. And they basically took over the US and divided it between them. And so Philip K. Dick came to believe that he remembered that as an actual timeline, not just as something he made up. And so, you know, he came up with this whole philosophy that someone or something is running the simulations, rewinding them, not liking the outcome and letting it run again and trying different outcomes. Kind of getting back to what you were saying earlier about we try out different scenarios and we were talking about dreams being simulations. He was taking it to a whole nother level. And so, you know, it occurred to me after that conversation that, well, if you can simulate one timeline, what do we do when we run simulations today? Like the weather, we run dozens of simulations and we figure out what the most likely outcome is. So we rewind and we run forward and I call that the core loop. And it turns out, you know, in quantum mechanics, so about a third of both books is dedicated to physics and quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, there's this weirdness about the wave and the particle duality. You may have heard of it. The idea is that the particle is not really a particle. It's a set of probabilities. It could be in many different places, but when you measure it, it's in one place, you know, kind of like Schrodinger's cat. Um, and the, the other popular interpretation is, okay, it's not probabilities, it's a multiverse, right? That every single probability exists in some uh, different parallel universe. So every time a quantum measurement is made, the world splits in two. And if you think of like a graph where everything is splitting, we have many different multiverses. And so, you know, this book is about that idea. It's called the simulated multiverse, that that is happening. But, you know, if you think about it, there's nothing in nature that you can just clone like that. Like I can't clone a human being. I can clone them. I can clone a sheep and as an embryo and I can grow it. You know, trees will drop acorns and they will slowly grow. So you have to grow things. You can't just take a planet and clone it. Uh, you know, the only thing you can clone is information. And it turns out in computer science, we do this all the time. In fact, we have the ability to take really at a very low level instruction that says copy all these bits, right? So if everything is bits, you can copy very easily. You can create multiple universes in a split second uh, in the same way that quantum mechanics is telling us that we either collapse the probabilities or many, like I said, many scientists believe we're creating these un new universes as we go. And so if we're able to simulate one timeline, there's no reason we can't simulate many timelines. And it turns out that some of the mysteries 
of physics which don't make a lot of sense when you think about them you know from a common sense point of view uh, like this observer effect that i talked about like this multiverse thing start to make much more sense when you think about it using philip k dick's framework that we are branching off different realities uh, and then we we may be choosing the one that is the most optimum. And so, you know, with a man in the high castle, I talked about that. He also came to believe that these beings, whoever they were, he called them the programmer and the counter programmer, which could have religious overtones. But uh, he didn't really know who they were. He said that they tried to prevent the assassination of JFK in Dallas. And when they did, he got assassinated in Orlando or in some other city or it led to a really bad outcome of nuclear war. So they rewound and let that original assassination attempt be successful. Uh, and, and I found that just an intriguing idea. So my next book is really taking the simulation idea one step further to say, what if we actually live in, in a simulation and there are multiple simulated timelines? And some people might even remember that. There's an effect called the Mandela effect, which I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, that? where some people remember, uh, a large number of people remember Nelson Mandela dying in the 80s in prison. Of course, in our timeline, he didn't die in 80s in prison in, 90, in the 1990s. He was released and became president of South Africa and died in 2013. So what happened was right near the time of his death, around 2010, um, you know, a lot of people said, wait, I thought he was already dead. I remember watching his funeral on TV. I remember, right? And so, you know, some people say, well, that's just misremembering. They confused him with this other activist in South Africa. Turns out some of the people that remembered this were people that had gone to South Africa to interview him in the 80s. So what are the chances that they <laughs> would think would mistake him for somebody else? And so uh, that there was this blogger, uh, she, she uh, named uh, Fiona Broom. She termed it the Mandela effect. At a, she was at a, a Star Trek convention in Atlanta, I think, at the time. And people were talking about a Star Trek episode that never existed, uh, but they remembered watching, you know, as a kid. And so this, the Mandela effect became a catch-all for people who remember an alternate timeline and something being different, whether it's as simple as, you know, Jiffy peanut butter, which doesn't exist because there was only Jiff peanut butter, or, um, you know, the Bernstein bears, or, which are really the Bernstein bears, they're not really spelled S-T-I-E-I-N, or certain logos, uh, or you get into these bigger events like Nelson Mandela's death. So it could be small things or big things, getting back to Philip K. Dick's ideas about small things or big things. And so, you know, I came up with a computer science-based explanation for the Mandela effect, which is that we are running these multiple simulated timelines and the memories are getting crossed because we merge and we select, we prune the tree to pick the most optimum, but some people still remember the, the other timeline. I love this type of stuff, man. You you get to live the dream getting to think about this and spend all day writing this and talking to smart people about these topics. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's certainly more fun than, you know, day to day, <laughs> having a job day to day, you know, even though, you know, I had startups, video game startups, they're still a grind because you have to like build every little thing and test every little thing. And, you know, customers calling you saying, hey, I didn't get my, uh, you know, virtual currency. <laughs> this is more fun than that. Right. <laughs> So you you went and you you're kind of like up here, right? Like in the big thought world, and then you're like, you know what? I should go write this book to help people build their their startups and their models inside of this uh, multiverse. And so you wrote this startup book. Yeah. So I've been thinking about the startup book for for many years, and so it's been percolating ever since my very first startup, which I did back in the '90s. Uh, and you know, even then, I, I would have sort of these misconceptions about you know what it meant to to do a startup and uh, how i should go about it and so uh you know i call those startup myths uh which are really you know kind of rules of thumb that people say but they turn out always not to necessarily be true so for example today in silicon valley everyone says you know you have to start a billion dollar company right no no venture capitalist wants to invest in you unless you get a unicorn which is the term that they use for a, a private company that's valued over a billion dollars incidentally that was a term coined by uh, one of my classmates from mit many years ago <laughs> aileen lee who became a famous venture capitalist uh, over at kleiner perkins and, and runs her own fund now and uh, uh actually ran against her for class president but she won back then <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but so, uh, you know, that's one of the myths is you have to start a billion dollar company. Now, it turns out that's not necessarily untrue. I mean, there's a kernel of truth to that. Investors want to invest, particularly venture capitalists, in a business that will have enough scale. The problem is you don't know at the beginning whether something could be a billion dollar company or not. Let's look at Slack, right? I mean, have you heard, you've heard of Slack? Everybody yeah. has used yep. it at work. Well, Slack started off as a game company, a video game company, and the game didn't work. And they abandoned it and created this communication tool, uh, which became Slack. So now if you said at the beginning, you know, do these guys have a billion dollar company, uh, potentially? I mean, there weren't that many billion dollar game companies back then. This was back in like around when I was doing uh, this game, Tap Fish. Uh, you know, when if you had made a million dollars from your game, that was considered, you know, pretty good for, for a mobile game. Uh, and so, so, and, and, uh, you know, speaking of when I was in college, one of my, we had this program where we'd go to Japan every summer and do an internship. And, uh, one of my, my co-founder in the, in the video game company back then we were classmates, he went to Japan and he met this guy named Jerry, uh, from Stanford, who was creating this little podunk thing. It was like a little directory of, uh, like a list of things called websites. I remember him and, and you know, even, even my co-founder, you know, who's a very successful entrepreneur now, uh, said, what is this little thing? Like nobody's ever going to use it. It's never going to amount to anything. <laughs> it turns out that was Yahoo, right? It became, it was Jerry Yang, who was the founder of Yahoo. So, you know, oftentimes the best way to build a billion dollar company is not to go around saying, oh, I'm going to build the next billion dollar company. It's to to work on something that intrigues you and to follow that thread, which could take you to something that's high growth, and then you will end up with a multi-billion dollar company. So that's one of the myths uh, that you know I found is very common. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of these, whether it's in raising financing, starting a company, uh, hiring people, et cetera. And so I wanted to put that together you know, into a book to try to teach some of the lessons. So the myths aren't untrue. They're just a good way to get into the complexity of the startup world. Uh, and, and that's another thing that I found, you know, was that there, there are rules. People, people are like, uh, you know, I just want to know what to do. And the problem is you can't just take the rules and apply them blindly, right? You will end up uh, with not the results that you want. You have to apply the rules differently in different situations. So it turns out building a successful startup is a complex thing. If it wasn't, then 90% of startups would be successful because all you would have to do is pull out the rule book and you could just follow it. I remember one reviewer of my book, Startup Myths, said, well, you know, this guy will tell us a story about, you know, one thing, and then he'll tell us the story about the opposite, you know? <laughs> and, well, how am I supposed to know what to do? Well, that's the whole point, is you have to apply <laughs> the context. So another rule that's very, very popular here is fail fast, pivot quickly, right? Which says that if the thing you're doing, it looks like it's not going to work, you need to, to fail and get rid of it and go do something else that's likely to be more successful. Uh, and so it turns out there are good examples of companies that started doing something that didn't work and they went on to do something else. But there's also examples of companies that started to do something that didn't work and they stuck with it. And eventually it did work. So a good example. So I, I mentioned uh, Slack uh, 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 where they pivoted and they found a niche that worked. Uh, it, there was a, uh, there's a company called Life360. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but they're actually one of the most downloaded apps of all time. And it's an app that lets you communicate with your family members. So I remember talking to the founder, uh, Alex Haro, and he said, well, the most common text message in the world was back then was, where are you, right? <laughs> Especially between family members, right? Uh, now, you know, maybe not, but back then, and smartphones were a new thing. And so they built this little mobile app that would let you keep track of where your family members were. Um, and it wasn't very successful initially. I mean, they got a little bit of funding in 2008, 2009. And so they decided, well, you know, people told them, don't do this. Go do Facebook for families or go do something else that can be successful. And they just said, no, you know, we think this is the right thing. So they just stuck with it. And turns out in 2011, 2012, when families actually had more than one smartphone, right? Because <laughs> that didn't happen until probably 2012. Suddenly, you know, they had exponential growth. And so that was a case where you didn't want to fail fast and pivot quickly. You wanted to stick with it. So what's the answer? You know, should you fail fast and pivot quickly or should you stick with it? Well, you have to look at the circumstances of the market. You have to look at the specifics of the product. And that's, if there's one thing that I've learned over the years in startups and people, you know, consider me an expert now is that I don't actually know that much, right? <laughs> 
because it, you know you have to keep kind of a, a zen like beginner's mind uh, and because every situation is a little bit different you will see patterns so there's lots of patterns i've seen so if you can recognize the patterns they tend to work for a while but then what happens is circumstances change um, and so in, in the book, I have one of the models, so it's called Startup Myths and Models. Uh, and models are different ways to think about how the markets are changing. So when I did Tap Fish, which was one of the most successful games at the time, you know, we spent like $25,000 to build a game and we spent $25,000 in marketing and it shot up to the top of the charts. And then because it was a good game, people told their friends. And so it stayed there. Uh, so you know, we learned a certain set of things to do in the mobile gaming industry. And, and the mobile gaming industry was pretty new, pretty small. Today, it's actually a $70 billion industry, just, just mobile games, not counting, you know, PC games or console games or anything else. And you can't spend $25,000 to <laughs> to market a game. It will get you nowhere. They'll get you like 10 users. I mean, not exactly, but you know what I'm saying? And, and we had millions of downloads. I think we eventually got like 30 or 50 million downloads, right? You, if, if Most games when they launch today, you have to spend millions of dollars per month on advertising. Uh, and you have to spend like $3, $1, $2, $3 per user. And so we spent 25 cents per user. So with $25,000, we got our first 100,000 users and those 100,000 users got another 500,000 users and those 500K got another million. And then we, we had enough money that we could spend more at that point. But what happens over time is startup markets evolve. The costs go up and the way that you approach the market changes. So actually I call this the startup market life cycle. And this is you know, kind of the, the one of the main models in the book is that um, startup markets go through these phases and they start off as this nascent stage where it's hobbyists, kind of like my story about Jerry Yang and Yahoo, right? Then it goes to what I call the recognized or growing phase, uh, which is a good time to get in because everything is growing. That's when we did Tap Fish. It, well, we weren't the first guys to build a game. That was in 2008. We did it in 2010. It was considered, starting to be considered the next big thing, but it still wasn't huge yet, right? Then we get to the super hot phase where everybody and their mother is trying to jump in, right? And we see that today with uh, crypto and Bitcoin. And in fact, Bitcoin has gone through this phase several times, the, these same phases. Uh, and usually that's not the best time to jump in because valuations are super high. It's actually a good time to sell because you can, um, you can sell for a very high multiple on revenues. Uh, then you go through the maturing phase where things start to become more expensive, leaders are established. And finally, you get to the mature stage. And in the mature stage, companies are public and they are valued based on profits, right? Today, you know, some game companies are valued based on profits. Um, and, and actually gaming is going through kind of another one of these phases now, but if you look at mobile gaming from where it started to where it ended up, there were several multi-billion dollar companies by 2016. It was really expensive. It was very difficult for a new person to get in. Um, so, so I mentioned we spent 25K and 25K to get Tapfish off the ground. In 2016, um, Niantic came out with uh, Pokemon Go, which became the most popular game on the planet at the time. So guess how much money they had raised before they released that game? It was a lot more than our 25K. It was $30 million, right? Wow. Um, so, you know, it was, it's just a whole different scale. And, and this is true. You know, I grew up in Detroit. And, you know, the big companies were like GM, Ford, and I'd see things like Oldsmobile and Buick. I'm like, why do we have these different names? Why, why don't they just call them GM cars? Well, it turns out Oldsmobile and Buick and Dodge, these were all garage entrepreneurs, right? They all got in when the market was young and you could literally, in a garage, you could literally build a, an automobile, uh, which, you know, a quadricycle is, uh, is uh, Henry Ford first called it with his very first startup. Uh, and then over time, today, it, to, for Tesla to create a new car, Elon Musk had to put in $180 million of his own money, not to mention probably $500 million of government money. So the, the amount of investment you need to put into a mature industry is very different than in a garage type industry. And so learning to recognize you know, that the markets evolve in phases is another aspect of, of the book. And so, so, so those are the myths and those are the models that, that I talk about in the book. I love it. Uh, fantastic. As you're sitting here, it's like the last 20 years of my life is just <laughs> the whole time I was like, yep, yep. Uh, as an entrepreneur, yeah, you described it perfectly. I think I'm super excited about the book. I haven't gotten to read it yet, but I, I'm really excited to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so the subtitle is called What You Won't Learn in Business School. And it was supposed to be called What You Won't Learn at Stanford Business School, because that's where I went to business school. But it was published by Columbia Business School. <laughs> and so they were like, well, we can't really, you know, put Stanford in the title. It sounds like we're dinging them. But the point was, when I was, when I was in business school, uh, we used to build these uh, spreadsheets and these models. In fact, we had a class called Modeling, and the professor literally wrote the book. It was an actual textbook on how to use Microsoft Excel for building these complicated spreadsheets. And he said we would build these decision models, and you would have, you know, scenario A, this is the output. Scenario B, this is the output. Scenario C, this is the output. And you just choose the one that has the best value. And I remember raising my hand and saying, well, what if you just change the number on the left, like the inputs? <laughs> he goes, well, then you end up with different results. And I said, well, how do you know what numbers to put in there? He goes, well, you know, either one, history, or two, that's where you, the manager, you know, get paid the big bucks. And it came down to your intuition. Well, if there's one thing that's true about startups is that the past does not equal the future. Right? <laughs> this is my whole point with stages of market changing. Now, if there's one thing that's true in big companies, they model based upon the past, right? Uh, GM, ExxonMobil, yeah, they'll do scenarios, but mostly they'll look at you know past scenarios and they'll try to model. And so it turns out these spreadsheets are mostly bullshit when it comes to startups, because if the past was the future, well, yeah, then you could do that. You could make assumptions. Otherwise, your assumptions are mostly wrong unless you have intuition, unless you kind of are sensing what might happen in the future. So, you, you know, this is where we tie back to quantum mechanics um, and we tie to intuition. I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Treasure Hunt, which was about tapping into these ideas of funny feelings and deja vu. And there was a, a physicist uh, uh, from Berkeley uh, named Fred Allen Wolf, who, you know, his interpretation of quantum mechanics was there are these different future selves and they are sending information back to us and we are choosing one of those possible futures. Uh, and, and, and the equations of quantum mechanics don't rule that out. In fact, the whole multiverse theory kind of assumes there are these different universes branching off uh, and they're sending back. So, you know, sometimes it, it comes down to your gut. And, and so, you know, that's part of why I, I wanted to have this book be about what you don't learn in business school because you can learn the specifics. You can learn what a term sheet is. You know, you can learn about valuation, how to issue shares. You can learn kind of the mechanical part, what I call the science of startups. But the thing that's very difficult to learn is the art of startups. And a lot of that comes down to judgment, personal preference, personal belief, your personal conviction, sticking to it, and most importantly, adapting to change in the market. So I said the past does not equal the future. Well, the big thing in startups is that the present doesn't equal the future either, right? Uh, so if you think of why Newton invented calculus, it was because, you know, you have these continuous curves, you have to kind of add up things, but the point is that you you, you have the, the velocity changing over time. And, and so you, you may only be at one moment at a time, but every moment is different. How do you calculate that? Well, it turns out, that, you know, whatever's happening today is not what's going to be happening tomorrow, right? I mean, you don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, but you can be pretty sure it's not going to be exactly Exactly what it is today. And by tomorrow, I mean a year from now, six months from now. Um, yeah, literally tomorrow, it may be the same, but <laughs> within a year, within the startup world, the market will have changed significantly. And this is true of virtual reality, right? I talked about virtual reality and, and the simulation. In 2016, when, when I first thought about this, virtual reality was considered the next big thing. And then within a couple of years, you know, uh, VCs have stopped funding consumer virtual reality because people just didn't like putting on the headsets as much. Right? Now that changed a little bit where enterprises started to use uh, virtual reality headsets for training. Turns out there was a real business case and that's actually a booming industry right now. So virtual reality training is a booming industry today. And as the headsets become lighter and AR headsets and VR headsets, it's changing again. Uh, and so, you know, if there's one truism, it's that things will change over time. Uh, and learning how to adapt to that change is a key part, I think, of being an entrepreneur or even an investor, you know, within the, the world of, of modern startups. Yeah, there's, there's no free lunch. There's no systematizing it and it working forever. I mean, the base nature of our universe is entropic anyways. So things are always going and coming, right? That's right. Yeah. So change is, is, is pretty constant. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's why there's a lot of books there out there on startups, but most of them try to give you a bunch of rules to follow. I give you a bunch of rules that you may or may not want to follow. <laughs> uh, and in some cases, you know, there, there are meant to be rules you've heard that you may not want to follow. Another one is, you know, um, hire the best people you can find. 
right? Which seems like a good good idea. You just uh, or hire the most experienced people you can find, right? Um, I I certainly believed it, and so in my first startup, you know, I tried to hire the most experienced marketing person, the most experienced VP sales most experienced VP development. And then I found out these guys weren't working together <laughs> at all. You know, guys and gals weren't working together very effectively because, you know, it's not about having optimizing every individual uh, position. It's about having a team that works well together to be able to implement the vision that you have. And sometimes the best people were people who didn't have that much experience. And the worst employees in a startup are the people who had a lot of experience and were inflexible and were unwilling to do it any other way than the way that they've done it in the past. And so this is where, you know, now, now that's true again in phases, in the, in the early days of a startup, that's very true. When you get to the later stages, when you're at 50 million, 100 million or more, then you want to hire the people that have experience doing exactly what needs to be done because by then you've defined the business model, right? Uh, one of the guys who uh, I have a little section quoting him is a guy named Jeff Buskang, who's a VC in Boston and he teaches at Harvard Business School. And he talks about product market fit where you know at the beginning it's like a jungle right you need a machete to get through then you have a dirt road when you've kind of found a little bit of part of market fit but you're still kind of making things up a little bit as you go and then finally there's a paved highway because that's when you figured out the product market fit and now you need to be able to optimize and send the most number of cars you know down that path uh, because it's already been defined for you and that's true within startups as well uh, and so you know that's another area that i think entrepreneurs get confused is how to become a good manager, right? Because usually most entrepreneurs are doing it themselves or, you know, managing one person, maybe or two people at the very beginning. Uh, how do you then transition into somebody who can actually manage uh, a bigger organization? And so there's another myth with engineers anyway. So I start off as an engineer, which is, you know, management is a waste of time, right? <laughs> Right. It's kind of like that old movie. What was it? Uh, Office Space, is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where yep. you know, the manager shows up with his coffee cup and says, yeah, that's great. Would you fill out these, you know, performance TPS reports? reports. TPS yeah. reports. <laughs> exactly. And so I certainly had that impression. And so when I became a manager, I was like, yeah, management's bullshit. I'll just do some work. But the problem was every time I was doing real work, I wouldn't get to the management stuff. <laughs> and turns out Management was work. You needed to spend enough time making sure people, you know, were getting over the obstacles and they were moving in the same direction. What happened, started to happen is everybody was going in different directions because I wasn't spending enough time managing them. Uh, and that can be pretty disastrous, you know, for the startup as well. And so there's like this balance. It's kind of like the waiter. Uh, and, and so what happens is many entrepreneurs become bad managers. Either they become like I did, which is an absent manager where uh, let them do whatever. I'm just going to do some real work, not this management stuff. Or they become micromanagers when they want, they're there like all the time and they're like, no, don't do it this way. Do it my way because this is the way I know how to do it. It's successful. It's kind of like the waiter in a restaurant and you know, there's a waiter who never shows up and you're like, damn it, I need some more water and they're never coming. And then there's the waiter who shows up in the middle of your conversation all the time and, and keeps interrupting you. And it's like, you need to find a balance between the two. And so there's an art, I think, for an entrepreneur in particular to become an effective manager is you have to balance the two. And so, you know, those are some of the, the myths that, that I get into when it comes to, to that side of, of starting a company. I fully agree. It's something that I'm constantly learning and getting better at. And you can see, you can go, you can look at the past, you know, four years of our revenue and it goes up, which looks good, but I mean, it goes up and down, but then ultimately it's on a steep curve up, but I can sit there and look at the dates and tell you like big key lessons. I learned quarters like by oh, quarters. Yeah. And you know, when I did the micromanaging or when I didn't manage enough or when I didn't let people go quick enough, or when I didn't, when I had the you know, the wrong person in, in this place when they should have been over here. Like, there's so many different scenarios. And then it's, it's interesting because we'll put out, you know, to our newsletter or, uh, you know, on social media, people asking questions, you know, what do you want to know from this guest or whatever it may be. And it really is like, part of me, like, I know we need to do that. We, we know the community, we get the questions, we get them answered. But part of me is like, there's just, no matter how much you prepare for this, the raw experience of just going through it and then keeping your eyes open while you're going through it, like you can't get around that. Like no amount of planning, no amount of book reading, no amount of conversations or one-on-ones with you know entrepreneurs asking it, but nothing's gonna get you over this hump of, you are going to have to do some very difficult things for a very long period of time and stretch yourself beyond belief and, and grow. And it's gonna be painful, but it's gonna be fun and rewarding. 
and it's going to suck, but ultimately it's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a great summary. I mean, you really have to go through it and you have to make the decisions based upon what's happening to you at the time. Uh, and, and I agree that, you know, no amount of book reading is going to be definitive for you. Uh, and that's, Part of what I try to get uh, across in this book is that, you know, the decisions have to be made in context, depending on where you are and where the market is and where your team is. Uh, and you you may end up applying completely different rules at different stages of the game. Yeah. Well, that's why. So I'm pumped about your book because the way I use books is for inspiration, right? So I don't look to them for concrete answers, right? I look to them to, for, for people that have, that are exploring ideas. So there's a hundred books about startups. I've read many books about startups, but the reason why we were excited to have you on the show and invite you is because they sent me the summary and I read through it. And I was like, this guy knows what he's doing. Right. And it was just the content of the book. I like to take my job here is to take the best ideas and amplify them. Like, I build a platform, right? Build a stage and I invite guests onto the stage because, you know, putting these ideas out there into the world is just something that I'm really passionate about. And I get, it keeps me excited. You know, some people, one of my favorite quotes is some people can stay excited for a few days. Some people can stay excited for a few months, but winners stay excited for however long it takes, right? Talking to people like you and hearing these these amazing ideas, this is what I will die doing this. Like this is the the best possible scenario in life for me. I love this. Yeah, that's great. And so you found your passion uh, and it's matching with something that you can actually do practically, right? Uh, and, and you're very good at it. And so, you know, I often tell people with startups as well as in life, you, know, you have to find an intersection of these three things. And if you find them, you're in good shape. And the, and the intersection is what do you like or want to do? What are you good at and what does the market need, right? So if, it, and, and sometimes startups fail because they're missing one of these, right? Maybe they really like to do something, but the market doesn't need it, or they're not very good at, you know, for example, we had a startup once, we were pretty good at enterprise software. We decided to release a consumer product. Turns out we weren't very good at a consumer product. And, you know, the amount of support requests we got overwhelmed our little team and it, it just didn't work because our product wasn't built for consumers. We just kind of repackaged it. And so what you're good at is just as important as what you think you want to do. Uh, but if you can find the intersection of those three things in your startup and in your life, uh, that's a good winning formula for success. I think it sounds like you have found that, that you know, for yourself. <laughs> I'm working at it. It's only been 20 years. So if <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing the same thing for 20 years, yeah. I'd no, say. no. I mean, I, <laughs> I, uh, programming for 17 years, but I mean, 20, 20 years since I've been trying to create businesses and I've had, I had some success. I had some false starts, right. Where I was building technology and then selling it off. And then I was watching them turn it into a business and make 10 times more money. And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> so I did that once or twice before I realized I shouldn't be selling this off and I'm going to have to figure out how to develop skills to run sales orgs and, or find the right people. And, you know, at the same time you were getting older. So, you know, you mentioned those three circles, right? And there's always context to it. Like if you're 18 and you hear those three circles, I mean, you're going to grow a little bit between 18 and 28. You're going to get a little more life experience. You're going to find out yeah. more things that you're passionate about. Um, so it'll just become... Yeah, you get more experience. Yeah, makes sense. And, you know, a lot of it is personality dependent too. Like, uh, you know, I'm currently spending time writing books. Uh, you know, many of my co-founders from my previous companies, you know, went on to create even bigger, more successful companies, you know, that are worth millions of dollars or hundreds of millions. And it's like, well, yeah, I could do that too. But, you know, I've, I've kind of done enough in that arena. And so, you know, I think we, we all have different attributes, right? Kind, kind of like getting back to the video game scenario, right? You, you know, you have people, uh, one of the guys I interviewed for Startup Mits was a venture capitalist named Brad Feld, who's really well I know Brad. Oh yeah, great. And so I met him back when he sold his first startup in Boston back in the 90s when I was doing my first startup as an advisor, uh, you know, and he's been in, in, in Colorado for a long time now. And so, you know, one of the things that, that uh, came out in his interviews, he said, 
venture capital firms are like uh, a team of Dungeons and Dragons players <laughs> because, you know, some are like a barbarian, some are like a wizard, and, and you have to look at the individuals and, and the partners and their personality, you know, and the same is true, you know, with entrepreneurs, right? Uh, and so I go through some of the different motivations. Some people just want to build things. Some people want to be masters of the universe. They're super competitive, right? Uh, some people are really committed to a particular technology or some people are very passionate about a particular market. And so each of us has different personalities. And usually, you know, when you have a team of people together, it, it, it kind of works if, if they're slightly different. So when you think of like some of the famous entrepreneurial teams like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak at Apple or uh, Microsoft with uh, Paul Allen and Bill Gates, right? They had very different motivations. <laughs> they were very different personalities. Um, and you kind of needed, you know, a bit of both. Uh, in, in order to get there. And so, you know, I think we, as we choose our characters in this simulation, uh, you know, we choose an avatar, just like in Dungeons and Dragons, we used to have, you know, intelligence, charisma, you know, strength, that said dexterity, whatever those uh, were, you know, kind of like in Westworld. I, I don't know if you've uh, seen Westworld. I love it. I, I look at myself like, a, I've been thinking about writing a whole book on about programming yourself or the analogies, the infinite analogies you can use about how we're like computers. But yes, I look at myself like a video game character and I have these traits and I'm like, where am I going to put my next, where am I going to spend my next coin? Where am I going to get that next? Right, because then you item? upgrade, you're, yeah. you're upgrading specific attributes that you're working on, right? Uh, and so I think that's a great way to think about, you know, startups and business as well as just life in general, I think, you know.